Well, good morning. This is Pastor Rick Tatina. I'm so glad you're with us. Um, I did want to let you know that there is going to be a new way to give to New Life Brookfield uh, online. And so it's a simpler, safer, and it's a smooth process um, for all of your giving as we uh, will transition toward it. The app we'll be using is called Push Pay, and 80% of the giving for New Life Community Church is done online, and this app will give us uh, the ability to um, use our phones and also use our computers and use our, our tablets and various devices to uh, be able to give towards your church location. And so, um, you can get started at newlifebrookfield.org. Click on the menu tab and the menu will drop down and the give, give tab will be the place to start there. I believe you're, when you first go there, you will, um, be sent a code to your phone or to your email and the process is very simple. And so, um, if you want to, uh, learn how to get started right away, you can uh, click um, the link there at newlifebrookfield.org in the Give tab, or you can text Brookfield to 77977. And once you get signed up, it'll be smooth, and we will be uh, transitioning this to this giving uh, software over the next weeks and months. And so um, just please, if you don't mind, if you're a regular giver, consider us and consider prioritizing that transition, which really should just take a few minutes. And we appreciate your patience and we appreciate your generosity towards us during this season. God bless you.
Your promise still stands. Great is your faith. 
Well, it's awesome to be with you as we bring this series to a close, the series um, called Citizens, People of Jesus' Kingdom. We hope you have enjoyed it. The first week we learned at the priority of God's kingdom in our lives and how we should and how we must regularly strive to prioritize God's kingdom in everything we do. And then last week we looked at our role as salt and light, as examples and influencers for that same kingdom. Uh, We were encouraged to be people of peace, be people of um, righteousness, even during this election season when everything is hostile and divided. And so our allegiance to Jesus transcends any allegiance we have to any political party or any candidate or any um, position. Not that it disagrees with them, but I'm just saying that there is a uh, preeminence that exists in the life of the believer that his allegiance is to Christ and God's people are also to be prioritized. And so we want to be that example and those influencers for good in our society. And so lastly, I want to um, turn our eyes toward um, the kingdom of God and the trajectory of the kingdom of God. The trajectory of the kingdom of God. Where is the kingdom of God headed? How will it wrap up? How will it conclude? I remember as a young person, you know, for for early times watching a TV show, and I remember kind of the TV show being so good, and it was moving towards you know, the hour, this is when some TV shows were an hour, it was moving towards the hour of the TV show being over. And as I looked at the clock, I thought it was only five minutes left for this TV show, but the plot line does not seem to be towards the end. I don't know how it could conclude so that it's over in the next five minutes. Well, sure enough, four minutes goes by and 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 we're, there's one minute left of the show, and there's an abrupt ending right at a point where you're not sure what's going to happen, and these three words pop on the screen, to be continued. To be continued. I'm sure you're someone who've, who's remembered something like that in your, in your uh, TV viewing days. Well, those were, those were, tough words to hear because you want to know how it concludes. You want to know how that episode wraps up. And you know what? Jesus wants to tell us how the kingdom of heaven will conclude. How it will be wrapped up. Now I'm not talking about the details of any kind of um, calamities or things coming before Jesus returns, but I'm talking about the kingdom of heaven and the people who associate with it. So maybe you're here and you're someone who you're wondering where things are headed. You're wondering how they're going to wrap up. How are they going to conclude? How are they going to finish? When there's no more to be continued, what will it look like? For the kingdom of heaven to be completed on this earth. Or maybe you're someone who you know that it's urgent for people to get right for God, get right with God, but you're not sure how that relates to the finishing of the kingdom of heaven. Or maybe you're someone who you're wondering what would happen on the last day when Jesus brings before him people who are his and people who are not his. Well, listen, this is an important message today. And I don't want it to be something that um, is taken lightly or is casually discussed. I really want you to see the importance of what Jesus is going to tell us in Matthew 13. And it is this. 
how you should expect God to conclude the mission of his kingdom. How is God going to wrap up the mission of his kingdom? And what will happen to people who are not his and people who are his when he wraps it all up? If you would, let's look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 through 50. This is a short little section here. Two points for us to digest, and trust me, it's enough. And it's really enough to motivate us to get on mission before it's too late. So how should you expect God to conclude the mission of his kingdom? Number one, God will separate his people from those who are not his people when the world ends. God will separate his children from those who are children of this world, children of the evil one, when his world ends. And all of those terms I just said, those come from the Bible. There are the children of light and there are children of darkness. Verses 47 through 49. Jesus says, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. A big, large net used for fishing that was let down into the sea and it caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it onto the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in the baskets and threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. Let's stop right there. There's a little bit more, but I want to save that for the next point. How will God conclude the mission of his kingdom? How you should expect him to conclude it? Number one, we said, was God will separate his people from those who are not his people on the last day when the world ends. Look, the kingdom of heaven and the mission of it, when people are preaching, when people are handing a Bible to a friend, when people are talking about the gospel on TV, on social media, when little posts go up on Facebook and Instagram and various places, when you see a billboard that's talking about God, that's talking about Jesus Christ, when churches are preaching the word and the gospel goes forth at the end of the sermon, people, all kinds of fish, all kinds of people are being gathered into this huge net. When they were talking about a drag net, it was not that type of fishing net that you threw from a boat. Like Peter, we, we often see that with the disciples. This was a different kind of net. It was a really w wide net that went across the shoreline. And the parts that went further into the water had weights on them. And they would throw that net in and the weights would drop into the water. But the men who were in, and the workers who were on the shore would hold on to the other edge of the net and, and after some time, they would start to drag it towards the shore. And what that net was doing when the weights dropped down was it brought all kinds of everything, actually. All kinds of fish, all kinds of sea creatures, even garbage and, and rocks and seaweed all into that net. And it tried to get as much as it could so that it would get the good fish and not let them escape. Then once they brought them to shore, they were able to collect the good fish and separate the bad fish, separate the, the bottom feeders that they didn't want, separate the seaweed and throw that all away and take the good fish and, and sell that and, and make dinner out of that, etc. And so that's the picture I want you to get when he's talking about this big net. So the kingdom of heaven, when it's being preached and brought forth in all kinds of venues is like that net. It's picking up all kinds of people. Now really, in, the, in that net, there are only two kinds of people. One are those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Those who have been born again. Those who are made new. Those who have turned away from sin and turned to Jesus Christ. And two, the other kind of person in that net is the person who has not been born again, who is not 
a follower of Jesus Christ. Now there are people of all kinds of stripes and shapes and ideas in those nets, in that net. But there's really only two believers, people who have been born again, and people who are not. And so they're being brought towards eternity. The net is being drawn closer to the shore. And it's like a big funnel where everything we're doing in the world, everything that's happening in the world is headed toward eternity. And some people, honestly, they're in the net and they don't even really know it. They don't know that eternity is where we're headed. They're not prepared for it. They're not really thinking on it. They're sort of going along with maybe this new um, move of God in the area or there's some um, big church thing going on and they go to it, but they never come to Christ. But they're in the funnel. They're in the net and it's going towards eternity and they're not ready. And they're not ready because they haven't believed in Jesus, of course. But also their lives are marked by sin and they need a cleansing of it through Jesus and they don't have it. Every single person in this world is headed toward eternity. Some don't know it. Some rarely think of it. Some maybe care less. Some are afraid to consider it. But it is of vital importance for us to deal with our relationship with God before the net gets to the shore because at the end of the when the net gets to the shore there is no more chance the angels it says will come and they will separate the good fish the people who are God's people and those who are not and that will be it now it says in verse 49, this is how it will be at the end of the age, at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. You see, people who have been born again, who have the Holy Spirit in them, are being moved by Him to do what's righteous in their lives. But those who are not, they still are following a pattern of sin. They're following the wicked one. Even if their lives look pretty put together on the outside, there isn't any allegiance to Jesus Christ. He's not their Lord. He hasn't saved them. They haven't reached for it. And the angels will come forth and will separate God's people on one side and those who are not God's people on the other side. Pretty sobering, but it's in the Bible, and we can't ignore it. We don't tear these pages out of our Bible. We read them, we believe them, we respond to them, because Jesus has given us these, these are his words. So God will separate his people from those who are not when the world ends. That's what God's going to do as he concludes the mission of his kingdom. I was reading some stories, and, and I don't mean this as a, a illustration that makes fun of anything, but there are these, sometimes there's these people that go to weddings, and they crash weddings. I know you've probably seen movies like this, or comedies and things, but but there's some people that really do this to take advantage of, like, the drinks, or or the food, or just being there, and they're really not supposed to be there. One example was there was uh, a wedding that was happening in this one area of a of a conference center. And then in the next room, there was some kind of famous person that was there and some people were meeting them. And 10 to 15 people sort of sneakily made their way into the wedding, gradually made their way up to the bar and were ordering drinks and were ordering all kinds of things that they were not supposed to because they were not invited to the wedding finally people who were in charge of the wedding the wedding coordinator caught wind of it and they were able to kind of 
put a put a stop to it and have the people leave. Those people were not welcomed at the wedding. They weren't part of that wedding. They didn't know those families. They weren't invited. And they had to be separated and kept out of the wedding. Now that's a little bit like the kingdom of God. But the way it's not like the kingdom of God is that people who get separated out from the wedding have been invited. So many, many people have been invited to come to Jesus Christ and they have not. And they will be separated because they have rejected the invitation. And as the net rolls towards eternity's rep, uh, rolls towards eternity, they will be shocked. And they will not be put with Jesus and his people on that side. We must deal with eternity. It's so important. Number two, here's number two, how you should expect God to conclude the mission of his kingdom. God will send away those who have proven to be evil and assign them an eternal destiny. And those who have proven to be his will also receive an eternal life. Let's look at verse 50, very short. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, very, very sobering. Very sobering picture. But I will be honest with you. The, the number one talked about topic in Jesus' ministry was eternal punishment. He warned people of it. He gave it pictures and illustrations like he does here, a fiery furnace where there's sorrow and anger and gnashing of teeth at God. Anguish and anger, inconsolable grief. He warned against it so people wouldn't go there and take seriously the soul status they have before God and get right with God. Because when the angels come forth and separate God's people from those who are not God's people, there will be eternal assignment of destinies, eternal life and eternal punishment. The furnace of fire is an imagery that is remi should remind us of the Old Testament when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace and God was in there. Jesus, there was a fourth person in there. And most people think, theologians think it was Jesus. And they were untouched by the fire. They didn't even have smoke on them when they were brought out. But yet, those who reject Jesus and face eternity without him will not be kept from the furnace's flames. They will be there for eternity. And there will be inconsolable grief and anguish. Gnashing of teeth usually meant just anger and bitterness. And weeping is a se severe sorrow that people will have. The afterlife and eternity is a real thing. It's something to consider. It's something that we're all headed toward. And it's something to deal with God's way. Here's a couple quotes I have from you about famous um, writers and, and celebrities and people who discounted and had a warped view of eternity, which did not does not fit what Jesus says here. One person said, I don't believe in the afterlife, so I don't have to spend my whole life fearing hell or fearing heaven even more. For whatever the tortures of hell are, I think boredom of heaven would be even worse. Now that's that's just false. Heaven will be eternal enjoyment of God and delight, a place where there's no crying and no sorrow. And hell is not something to discount. 
Another man said, when he heard the accounts of people who had near-death experiences and how they all felt a peace and how they all felt like a warmth and a light, that he was forced to discount the biblical view of hell that faces us after we die. Let me give you one more. One person said, I consider the concept of reincarnation. The old paradigm of heaven and hell is just too cruel. It's too unchristian to be believed. If you die in your sin, you spend eternity in hell. How could a compassionate God of mercy ever set up such a system? On the other hand, I was drawn, drawn to the idea that you keep coming back till you get it right. Reincarnation seemed merciful and completely Christ-like. Jesus got it right the first time around and was, after all, God incarnate, perfect man. But the rest of us would need several lifetimes to shed our sins and learn the lessons necessary to heal our troubled souls. I'm sorry, but that is wrong. Yes, Jesus came and got it right the first time, but we have a chance to get it right because he has provided the way for us. These three views, and there's many more, should be considered untrue, and Jesus' words should be believed over these, or over any ideas you hear from your friends, or anything that you hear on TV, or anything that you read that questions the words of the Bible. Believe that there is a net carrying everyone, even these people, towards eternity. And to have Jesus' blood cover you is what you want. But listen, we're not there yet. We're not in eternity yet. The net hasn't come across to the shore yet. It could be getting close. But it hasn't happened yet. And Jesus gives us a couple things of what we're supposed to do before that day. Verse 51 and 52. He asks his disciples, have you understood all these things? He's talking about all the parables. The parable of the sower. The seed, the word of God is sown out. Are we, are, some people are grabbing it. Some people are not. There's the precious pearl. Go for it. It's the kingdom of God. Sell everything to get it. The man who finds the buried treasure, he buys the whole land to get the treasure. People go after God. Go buy more than you can, buy more than you must to get God, metaphorically speaking. And then we have the dragnet. We're headed toward eternity. It will be wrapped up. And he says this, but we're still on mission. It hasn't happened yet. So he says, if you've understood the parables, which they say yes, he says, therefore every teacher of the law, every Bible student who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven, which is you, I hope, as a Christian, you are like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures and old. Listen, you are an owner of the house. And you're able to bring out biblical truths, treasures. Treasures that perhaps people will find salvation in because it's the treasure they should go after. And you'll bring out insights and treasures from the Old Testament and from the New Testament to lead people to Christ. You can do it. You understand the parables. Jesus has given you a mission to bring people into the shores ready to go into eternity. Let's pray. God, please let us embrace our mission and give us people in our paths that we can bring out treasures of the kingdom, new and old, insights from the Old Testament that point to you, and insights like this parable of the dragnet, that we might share them with others, that they might be brought to eternity's shores as one of your child, as one of your children. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.